Hey everybody, to, uh, to build on the um, additional questions that we've previously covered regarding the ACCS exam, um, I put together uh, this PowerPoint, which covers yet um, more questions, uh, answers, as well as explanations as to why the correct answer is correct, and in most cases, why the incorrect answers are correct. So we hope you, uh, you get something out of this in your preparation for the ACCS exam. So now let's take a look at some actual questions. Question 51, question 51. A patient receiving volume control ventilation. The patient has become increasingly agitated and the end tidal CO2 has decreased from 39 to 28 over the last two hours. Which of the following is the most likely cause? A, increased cardiac output. B, main stem intubation. C, high body temperature. And D, D increased ventilation. The answer is D, increased ventilation. The explanation or general feedback goes like this. The most likely cause of this patient's low end tidal CO2 is hyperventilation caused by the patient's apparent agitation. Treating the cause of the ag agitation may restore normal ventilation and thus normalize end tidal CO2. High body temperature or fever increases metabolism and would tend to increase, not decrease, expired CO2 levels. Main stem intubation is what we call in the MBRC as a distractor, normally would not affect capnographic readings. Question 52. An unconscious patient submitted to the emergency department and has an SpO2 of 94%, but the analysis of an arterial sample on a co-oximeter reveals an SaO2 of 69%. Which of the following problems is most likely the issue? A, carbon monoxide poisoning, B, opiate drug overdose, C, diabetic ketoacidosis, or D, acute pulmonary edema? The answer is carbon monoxide poisoning, but let's take a look at why that's the correct answer. The most likely problem is carbon monoxide poisoning, most standard, two wavelength pulse oximeters, which is pretty much the, the standard of care today, cannot detect carboxyhemoglobin levels, or HBCO. On the other hand, analyzers that use multi-wavelength, such as co-oximeters, can detect the presence of abnormal hemoglobin, such as carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and others, and thus provide an accurate measure as to the patient's SAO2. Further clue in this case is that the patient is unconscious. Carboxyhemoglobin levels over about 20 to 25 percent, it's likely in this case, will often cause a loss of consciousness. Question 53. A 48-year-old, 180-pound male orally intubated in the field, receiving mechanical ventilation with a 6.5 endotracheal tube, and it's secured in place, which requires cuff pressures of 38 centimeters of water to prevent significant volume loss. Which of the following actions would be most appropriate in this case? A, replace the endotracheal tube with a smaller size. B, accept the large volume loss during inspiration. C, replace the endotracheal tube with a larger size, and D, deflate and reinflate the cuff with 20 mLs of air. The answer is C, replace the endotracheal tube with a larger size. The explanation goes like this, the most common cause of high end tidal, or excuse me, endotracheal tube cuff pressures being needed to obtain a seal is that when the tube is too small. You su suggest reintubating the patient with a larger endotracheal tube, or of course using a tube exchanger to do so in order to prevent excessive cuff pressures and the potential for mucosal damage. 
The only word of caution is if you do use a tube exchanger, make sure that you have uh, trained personnel and intubation equipment because probably around a third of the time or so, um, the, the old tube that's coming out over the tube exchanger or the new one that's going in, they, they don't pass well and you know time is, is passing and it becomes necessary to abort that whole thing and just go to uh, reintubating the patient. Question 54. A patient's mixed venous PO2 has decreased from 41 to 27 tor or millimeters of mercury over the last hour. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for this change? A. The blood sample was withdrawn too rapidly. B. The patient's temperature has decreased. C. A pulmonary diffusion defect is developing. And D. The patient's cardiac output has decreased. The answer is D, the patient's cardiac output has decreased. And I urge you to just reflect back on the FIC equation, the FIC equation, which is where you're actually looking at the difference in the, the content of the arterial versus the venous blood, uh, the, the oxygen content that is. Um, and as that difference widens with all else constant, cardiac output will have dropped. So the general feedback is venous oxygenation parameters indicate that the adequacy of tissue oxygenation relative to blood flow, period. The drop in PVO2 from a normal value of 41 to 27 millimeters of mercury abnormally low indicates inadequate perfusion relative to tissue needs, as usually is caused by a significant decrease in cardiac output. A diffusion defect would, would lower arterial oxygen parameters while withdrawing blood too rapidly via pulmonary artery catheter would result in a falsely high level of mixed venous oxygen. Question 55. A patient receiving volume control ventilation, which of the following changes would occur if the patient's compliance were to decrease? A, the expiratory time would increase. B, the flow rate would decrease. C, the peak pressure would increase, and D, the delivered volume would decrease. C, the peak pressure would increase. The key here is the patient's not on pressure control ventilation, they're on volume control ventilation. So again, that volume is pretty much assured, obviously subject to the pressure limit of the ventilator, but what is variable is the pressure. General feedback, looks like this. When faced with either a decrease in compliance or an increase in resistance, a ventilator operating volume control mode will deliver a constant volume, but at a higher peak pressure. Delivered volume will decrease only if the preset pressure limit causes the ventilator to prematurely end inspiration. Question 56. Cardiac infarct or ischemia, which of the following lab tests would you recommend to help confirm the diagnosis? Alkaline phosphatase, B, serum troponin, C, blood urea nitrogen, or D, total cholesterol? The answer is B, serum troponin. Let's look at why. Cardiac biomarkers or enzymes are used to assess for cardiac muscle damage due to ischemia or infarct. Current cardiac biomarkers include total creatine kinase and its heart-specific isoenzyme CKMB, myoglobin, or troponin-1. Tr troponin-1, however, is considered the best of these markers. Typically, troponin-1 serum levels increase soon after an MI and peak in about 12 hours. Alkaline phosphatase is a liver enzyme used to assess liver function. Blood urea nitrogen is a screening test used to assess renal function and total cholesterol as measured to assess risk for heart disease. So just keep in mind, if you're um, aiming to take the ACCS exam, hopefully you all are, um, that this really, this question doesn't just, doesn't just speak to cardiac enzymes, okay? It also um, asks you to expect to know things like you know, some of the liver markers, some of the, the renal markers, etc. So some of the more discrete, um, if you will, lab values 
that you're uh, not as heavily emphasized on, let's say, the TMC exam, you know, the entry level exams for respiratory therapists, they're more heavily emphasized in the ACCS exam. The other thing regarding uh, cardiac enzymes is keep in mind that they're, they're really, you know, whether irrespective of which one that you're really looking at, they're not going to actually become clinically apparent for about four to six hours. Um, irrespective of which of the three you're really looking at there. So it's not of great value to draw them, you know, 30 minutes after the onset of a STEMI or, you know, chest pain or something along those lines. It really, really should be done um, beyond that at, at a later time. Question 57. Building on the theme of coaximetry, so coaximetry analysis should be performed whenever the following information is needed. Total CO2 content, A. B, acid-base balance status. C, bicarb or HCO3 concentration. D, abnormal hemoglobin levels. The answer is D, as many of you suspected. Unlike SpO2 and PaO2, coaximetry measures total hemoglobin in a blood sample and fractions of the total percent saturations bound to hemoglobin and other chemicals. Measures include total hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and others, including sulfa hemoglobin. In addition, total O2 content, that's CaO2, in milliliters per deciliter of the sample is calculated. Question 58. Which of the following would provide the best bedside assessment of the need for ventilatory assistance in a patient with myasthenia gravis? A, functional residual capacity. B, vital capacity. C, closing volume. And D, total lung capacity. The answer, as some of you suspect, B, vital capacity. NIF would also be a good measurement, but it's not a choice. Let's look at the feedback. Myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular disease that affects muscle strength. Of the tests listed, the vital capacity requires the most muscular effort from the patient and would be the first of these tests listed to decrease in neuro neuromuscular disease or disorders. Question 59. A patient admitted to the emergency department or ER is suspected of having suffered airway injury due to inhalation of toxic fumes. To determine the location and extent of potential injury, you would recommend which of the following procedures? A, VQ scan, B, chest x-ray, C, blood gas analysis, and D, bronchoscopy. The answer is D, bronchoscopy. Let's look at why. Injury from toxic inhalation or aspiration most immediately affects the airways. In these patients, the location and the extent of the injury is best determined initially using fiber optic bronchoscopy. Question 60. A patient having just undergone major thoracic surgery is placed on pressure control AC ventilation with 10 centimeters of PEEP. You observe continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber of the pleural drainage system. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this observation? A, the patient has a pleural effusion. B, the suction vacuum pressure is too low. C, the drainage system is obstructed. And D, the patient has a bronchopleural fistula. This is really a thinking person's question, and you absolutely can expect questions that relate to chest tubes on the ACCS exam. The answer is D, patient has a bronchopleural fistula. I actually had a patient like that uh, this past Saturday, for real, we ended up putting them on pressure control ventilation because it, it better compensated for the leak. General feedback, continuous bubbling in the water seal of the pleural drainage system indicates a leak. The leak may be in or at the patient, bronchopleural fistula, or in proper seal at the insertion point. Alternatively, the leak may be in the collection system, collecting tubing or chamber system. An obstructed drainage system will cause the loss of bubbling in, in the pressure control chamber or failure the water seal level to fluctuate with breathing. 
So in this case, the most likely cause is continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber is a bronchopleural fistula. P.S. You'd be able to uh, help uh, ascertain whether or not it was at the patient or at the system. If you pinch it, okay, and the bubbling continues, it's, uh, uh, it's in the system. If you pinch the, the, the chest tube and, it's, and it stops, it's most likely a bronchopleural fistula in the patient. Question 61. To maximize FiO2 delivered by a manual bag valve resuscitator, you would attach a peep valve, A, B, decrease bag refill time, C, remove the inlet valve, and D, increase bag refill time. The answer is D, increase bag refill time. Think about this. So if you're pumping away at, at, at the AMBU bag, there's less refilling time for the 100% the oxygen to refill in there. So it kind of actually makes sense. But let's look at the more formal feedback. The oxygen concentration delivered by a manual resuscitator or bag valve mass system, or some of us call them AMBU bag, depends on one. The, the uh, flow of oxygen to the bag, two, the size of the oxygen reservoir, and three, the bag refill time. The greater the input flow, the larger the reservoir, and the longer uh, slash slower the bag refill time, the higher the FiO2. So it's pretty uh, uh, much an in information rich question in this case. Question 62. You note the reading from a pulse oximeter equipped with a disposable finger probe has decreased from 93 to 71 over a two to three second period without a change in FiO2 or patient condition. No signs or symptoms of significant distress are noted. The corresponding waveform has become erratic. Most likely cause is A, the oximeter needs to undergo recalibration. B, probe is overheated and should be removed. C, the, the probe, a probe site needs to be uh, warm to 42 degrees. And D, the probe or probe cable is malfunctioning. Look at the, the choices or and pick the best one. D is the answer, probe or probe cable or malfunctioning. You know, uh, where a patient, uh, hemoglobin saturation, uh, you know, Basically, it's very unusual for, for a patient, almost impossible for their, their SAT to go from 93 to 71 in a couple of seconds type of deal. So right, right away, you got to be thinking, you know, particularly with a fairly stable patient, you got to be thinking that they, there's an issue with the equipment. So manifestations such as cyanosis, increase in heart, respiratory rate, as well as distressed appearance or decrease in mental status would likely become apparent if indeed their, their saturation was 71. Since pulse oximeters do not require manual calibration, that's what we know as a distractor choice, the most likely problem is an equipment malfunction. And of the equipment malfunction choices you have, the, the uh, D or the probe or probe cable is the one that's uh, the mo most suitable here. Question 63, which of the following would most likely affect the accuracy of a capnographer end tidal CO2 uh, measurement? A, water vapor, B, O2 concentration, C, system leaks, or D, patient fever? C, system leaks is the best answer. So end tidal CO2 levels vary normally according to the patient's CO2 production, such as metabolic rate, breathing pattern and rate, dead space, and tidal volume slash minute ventilation. Significant errors in measurement can occur due to leakage of air into the system or the presence of liquid vapor in the, in the system sensor or sampling line. Because end tidal CO2 measurements are standardized to body temperature pressure standard conditions are saturated, neither the presence of water vapor nor the body's uh, uh, body temperature would affect instrument accuracy. Variations in O2 concentrations have minimal effect on device accuracy, most of the units providing automatic compensation for FiO2. Question 64. An intubated patient with COPD who is in respiratory or acute respiratory failure requires intubation mechanical ventilation. To help this patient during pressure support trials, you would recommend which of the following? A, airway pressure release ventilation. B, pressure support with adjustable off cycling. C, mandatory minute ventilation. Or D, high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Remember, this is the ACCS exam. So we, I'm going to just tip my hand here and say we don't use oscillatory ventilation on adults anymore. We do, we do on babies, but not on adults. The answer is B, pressure support with adjustable off-cycling. Let's take a deeper dive. 
Intubated patients typically require pressure support to help overcome the extra work imposed by the artificial airway during spontaneous breaths. Unfortunately, pressure support may vary uh, in, in cases of COPD patients, and they may experience a slower rise and decrease in inspiratory flow, which can off, you know, delay off cycling and increase auto peak. The ability to adjust pressure support off cycle to a higher percent of peak inspiratory flow in patients with COPD can improve patient ventilator synchrony and reduce inspiratory muscle effort. That's a mouthful. Oh yeah. Question 65. When using a transport ventilator with a single limb breathing circuit, the low volume and low PEEP CPAP alarm sound simultaneously. The most likely cause of this problem is A, condensate buildup in the circuit, B, a disconnected inspiratory valve line, C, a kink in the main tubing circuit, and D, blockage of the expiratory port. The answer is B, a disconnected expiratory valve line. Simultaneously sounding of a low volume and low PEEP slash CPAP alarm on a ventilator that uses a single limb breathing circuit usually indicates the loss of pressure, pressurization of the expiratory valve, the mushroom valve, if you will. The most common cause of which is a disconnected expiratory valve line. Question 66. A laryngectomy patient with a double cannula laryngectomy tube exhibits signs of a complete airway obstruction. After you call a rapid response team, you remove the inner cannula but cannot pass a suction catheter. Your next action should be to A, pull the laryngectomy tube, insert an ET tube into the stoma and bag the patient via ET tube. B, plug the laryngectomy tube insert a laryngeal mask airway and bag the patient via the LMA or laryngeal mask airway. C, pull the laryngectomy tube, bag the patient via pediatric face mask applied over the stoma. And D, orally intubate the patient, plug the laryngectomy tube and bag the patient via ET tube. Let's see what the right answer is. C, Pull the laryngectomy tube, bag the patient via pediatric face mask applied over the stoma. Some of the specifics on this, if a laryngectomy patient with a double cannula laryngectomy tube exhibits signs of complete airway obstruction, first, remove the inner cannula and try to pass a suction catheter. If you cannot pass the catheter, remove the laryngectomy tube, provide bag valve ventilation and oxygenation via pediatric face mask or LMA applied over the stoma. Only if this method fails to, to provide adequate ventilation and oxygenation should you consider intubating the stoma with an ET tube. Question 67. Obviously it relates to this ECG or EKG strip. An adult stroke victim is brought to the ER in cardiac arrest. CPR is continued, proper tube placement is confirmed, and IV access is established. After five minutes of CPR, no pulse is present, and the following rhythm strip is observed. You should recommend which of the following. A, continue chest compressions. B, perform cardioversion. C, perform defibrillation. D, administer epinephrine. A, continue chest compressions. Let's look at why. The presence of a normal sinus rhythm with the absence of a pulse indicates PEA or pulseless electrical activity. CPR with compressions should continue while ruling out possible causes of the PEA. And if you remember back, it does absolutely pay to study the H's and T's that we learned when we took ACLS that could absolutely contribute to the patient being in P PEA and to try to reverse those causes. Question 68. You can blindly insert an ET tube into the trachea through which of the following supraglottic airways? 
an LMA or a laryngeal mask airway, a combat tube, a Goodell, or a Copa? The answer is LMA. That Copa sounds a little like Copacabana. If it sounds like Copacabana, maybe it's not the correcta. General feedback. You can blindly insert an ET tube through a laryngeal mask airway. A 6.0 ET tube can be passed through a number three or four LMA, while a seven ET tube can be passed through a number five LMA. Remember for adults, three, four, or five, with five being the largest for LMA sizes. A variant of the standard LMA, the LMA Fast Track, is designed specifically for use as a guide for intubation of the trachea. You can also blindly insert an ET2 through a King LT airway. Question 69. You are assisting a physician in exchanging an ET tube of a patient using a fiber optic bronchoscope as a reintubation guide. You should remove the old tube when which of the following? A, immediately upon insertion of the FOB, fiber op optic bronchoscope, into the pharynx. B, only after confirming the FOB tip is just above the carina. C, prior to insertion of the FOB into the pharynx. And D, only after the new tube is positioned in the trachea. Correct answer is B, only after confirming the FOB tip is just above the carina. Let's look at why. During fiber optic assisted ET tube exchange, a small pediatric size bronchoscope is preloaded or ensleeved with an ET tube. Using the scope for visual guidance, the tip of the new tube is positioned in the laryngopharynx. Then the tip of the scope is passed through the glottis into the trachea alongside the existing tube. So it obviously requires deflation of the old tube cuff. Only after the scope tip is confirmed to be in proper position, just above the carina, should the old tube be removed. Once the old tube is removed, the physician threads the new tube over the bronchoscope into the trachea. It's a mouthful, but really what they're talking about here is difficult airway situations, and you could absolutely expect the MBRC and the ACCS exam to have several questions related to difficult airways. Question 70. A doctor institutes volume control ventilation for an 80 kilogram ARDS patient. Which of the following is the maximum pressure you would aim to achieve in this patient? Let me say, when, when, the, when the MBRC says an 80 kilogram ARDS patient, you can assume or assert that the 80 kilograms is the uh, near the uh, predicted or ideal body weight. If they give you height, you're going to need, need to do some calculations. Um, so perhaps they have somebody who's, you know, 5'9", um, but they're, they're, they're um, uh, you know, 110 kgs. Somebody who's 5'9 should be about 70 kgs. So if they give you the height, different story, but they only give you the weight, um, you can pretty much assert that that's pretty much close to their ideal or predicted body weight. So in this, in this particular question, the, the first choice, or A, is 50 sonometers peak pressure. B is 30 sonometers plateau pressure. C is 40 centimeters peak pressure, and D is 50 centimeters of plateau pressure. Think back to ARDSnet, okay, and think, think back to what ARDSnet actually really talks to and talking to which pressures are potentially most uh, injurious to patients in ARDS. Correct answer is B, 30 centimeters of plateau pressure. And I will tell you that, that basically um, ARDSnet talks to trying to keep plateau pressures at 30 or less for adults, preferably 25 or less. That's, that's a key um, threshold. 
folks that um, are maintained at plateau pressures above 30 tend to have a much higher risk of ventilator induced lung injury. According to, again, the, uh, the NHLBI protocol, so it's really ARDSnet, the target volume for ARDS patients is four to six mLs per kg with a maximum plateau or alveolar pressure of 30 sonometers of water. Ventilator rate should be initially set to match the prior uh, minute ventilation or VE, but can be increased as, as needed to a maximum of 35 breaths per minute. In addition, a slight hypercapnic state, so it's known as permissive hypercapnia, um, you know, can be permitted at that 7.25 to 35, and a PCO2 slightly above that, you know, 45, so 45 to 50, known as permissive hypercapnia, may be tolerated in order to maintain a lower tidal volume needed to keep those plateau pressures equal to or less than 30. Broader point here is that definitely pays to um, review ARDSnet guidance when it comes to uh, tidal volumes, when it comes to, um, you know, again, uh, maintaining uh, plateau pressures, um, as well as, you know, how you would actually set your PEEP um, and your FIO2. Very, very valuable lessons there. Question 71. A patient with a history of dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain, when engaging in minimal activity has a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 33, tor or millimeters of mercury, and a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of eight. Patient would mo most benefit receiving which drug, which of the following category? Okay, so this question again speaks to understanding hemodynamic pressures and understanding some of the medications, the non-respiratory medications that, that, that can be recommended in order to, if you will, um, optimize or enhance hemodynamics. So in the choices here, A is an ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, ACE inhibitor, B, a pulmonary vasodilator, C, an angiotensin receptor blocker, and D, an antiarrhythmic or dysrhythmic agent. Correct answer? B, a pulmonary vasodilator. Let's look at why. According to the clinical information in this case, the patient has advanced class three pulmonary hypertension, not, not associated with heart failure. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal. For these patients, a pulmonary vasodilator is indicated. Common drug agents can be used for IV or inhaled prostacycline, such as Flolon, or oral, again, these, these pulmonary uh, vasodilators. Um, again, these, these uh, uh, guaisine uh, sequinase uh, uh, stimulators can be used as well. So there's a whole class, but in this particular case, those other drugs aren't mentioned, and what is mentioned um, is a pulmonary vasodilator. So one should look to uh, in that direction for a situation like this. Question 72. When monitoring a patient receiving volume controlled AC ventilation, you note the following. Monitor parameters, these alarm settings. So exhaled tidal volume, 700. Peak inspiratory pressure, 30. High pressure limit, 60. Low pressure limit, 20. Low tidal volume alarm, 600. And high respiratory rate alarm, 30. You should, you should, based on this information, decrease the high pressure limit to 45. B, increase the high respiratory rate alarm to 40. C, de decrease the low tidal volume alarm to 500. And D, decrease the low pressure alarm to 10. So scant information here, but they're looking for you to glean through and be able to kind of see where the outlier information is and what um, what recommended action uh, should should take place? Answer is A. Decrease the high pressure limit to 45. Recommended alarm settings are as follows: low tidal volume is uh, a 10 to 15 below the set or targeted tidal volume. 
high pressure limit of 10 to 15 above the average peak pressure, low pressure alarm of 5 to 10 below average peak pressure, high respiratory rate alarm for adults, 30 to 35. And in the case of high pressure limit uh, is 30 above the peak inspiratory pressure and should be decreased to 40 to 45. Question 73. Doctor orders lung recruitment maneuver for a patient with ARDS who is just uh, intubated and placed on pressure control AC ventilation. So if you guys don't use pressure control very much, MBRC absolutely will have some questions related to pressure control, this being you know, an example of one that could. Prior to implementing the maneuver, you would want to assess which of the following. A, arterial blood pressure. B, oxygen consumption. C, renal output and bun. D, physiologic dead space. The answer is A, arterial blood pressure. Let's look at why. Because a recruitment maneuver can decrease cardiac output, and really think about it, you, you recruitment maneuver, you're using you know, 30 centimeters of, of peat for 30 seconds or 40 centimeters for 40 seconds. There's moderations to that as well. But you think about what that can do. That can actually, you know, squeeze, tamponade the heart, decrease venous return. So it can have a decrease and uh, effect of decreasing cardiac output and tissue perfusion due to the high intrinsic pressures. Recruitment maneuvers should only be conducted on hemodynamically sta uh, stable patients, most commonly defined as those having a mean arterial pressure greater than or equal to 60 to 65 not required recent alterations in vasoactive or inotropic drug dosing. The other kind of rule of thumb, loose rule of thumb would be the patient's systolic uh, systemic pressure needs to be, you know, greater than 90 to 95. Question 74. Before giving your patient an aerosol treatment with ischemic ep epinephrine for laryngeal edema, you check his vital signs. His pulse rate is 85, the respiratory rate is 16. Five minutes into the treatment, the pulse rate climbs to 135. So going from 85 to 135, and his respiratory rate rises from 16 to 29. So it doesn't quite double, but real close to it. Which is the best action in this case? So this this, this uh, question is really playing to patient safety and patient, patient monitoring. A, continue the treatment as ordered uh, to completion. Sounds sketchy. B, switch to albuterol and continue the treatment. C, stop the treatment, monitor the patient and contact the physician. Obviously, you know, notifying the nurse. D, ask the nurse what action she would recommend. It's a sexist statement, but she or he would recommend. C, stop the treatment, monitor the patient and contact the physician. Feedback, uh, the significant rise in heart rate greater than 50% suggests that the patient is experiencing an adverse reaction to racemic epinephrine. For this reason, the therapy should be stopped, the patient should be stabilized, and the physician, and I'm gonna add nurse, should be contacted. Remember, racemic epinephrine, is, it's gonna achieve some bronchodilation, it's gonna obviously achieve some vasoconstriction because of the alpha, the beta two, but it can absolutely also have some beta one and, and can increase the heart rate as well. Question 75, question 75. You actually see a graphic here. So we're again, tipping our hand with some of these graphics to kind of let it soak in a little bit before we ask the question. Let's take a look at the question. You observe the following pressure volume loop display on a patient receiving volume control ventilation. Which of the following actions would be appropriate? A, decrease the delivered volume, or you say recommend decreasing the delivered volume. Increase the inspiratory flow. C, decrease the IE ratio, and D, increase the peak level. So what you're seeing here in this pressure volume curve, very, very uh, rich in, in information, is a beak, beak, at the, if you will, the upper right-hand side there. It's associated with over distension, over distension. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the, you know, with that information in hand, let's take a look at some of the, uh, the, the correct answer and some of the explanation here. 
decrease the delivered volume. We're over distending the lung, causing that beak. So the pressure volume loop exhibits significant flattening beyond the upper inflection point, indicating over distension of the lungs. Due to its resemblance to a, you know, if you will, bird beak, if you will, sometimes called the beaked pressure volume loop. When you observe this problem, you generally can resolve it by either reducing the volume or in volume ventilation or reducing the pressure setting if it's a pressure control and you're setting uh, directly a delta P. Question 76, the last of this batch. It's kind of like a quasi bonus question, if you will. A patient is receiving mechanical ventilation in SIMV mode at an FiO2 of 65%, the following arterial blood gas results are reported. pH of 7.42, PaCO2 of 41, PaO2 of 47, bicarb of 25, base excess of zero. What's particularly troubling is the, the oxygenation. So that PaO2 of 47, you have an FiO2 of 65, so you basically have a, a P to F ratio in the low 100s. Which of the following actions would you recommend to be taken first? First, increase the SAMV rate. It's A, B, initiate PEEP. B, C is get a new arterial blood sample. And D is increase the FAO2 to 100%. So the, really, the key here, you guys get this, but the key here is patients are already on 65% and they're still um, you know, severely hypoxemic. Um, so this, the raising the FiO2 is, uh, you know, it hasn't really uh, you know, worked or paid any dividends here. So let's see what they're recommending. Initiate PEEP or increase the PEEP. And let's look at the feedback. Patient's acid base uh, status is, is normal. It's not, not really the issue. So no change in minute ventilation is warranted. On the other hand, the 60-60 rule of thumb for oxygenation comes into play here. So the patient's on 60%, but their, their PO2 is less than 60. Indicates significant shunting that will um, not respond to further increases or not respond proportionally to further increases in oxygen concentrations or FiO2. The solution or the best answer is to initiate PEEP or increase the PEEP. It will help open up collapsed alveoli, decreasing shunting and increasing you know, PaO2, ideally allowing the lowering eventually, the lowering of the FiO2. So with that, we're done with this batch of questions. Again, I'm again sharing with you some of the um, resources that are out there, one of them being the um, the, the textbook that uh, Narc Rodriguez and I um, have, fourth edition, Comprehensive Respiratory Therapy Exam Guide. So it's a, it's a book, but it also has some online resources that can be used as well. Egan's Fundamentals, I'm totally biased in favor of it. Um, we actually are working on a 13th edition as we speak, but this is the one that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and then, you know, we're not proud. So, you know, Kettering is an outstanding resource as well. We certainly would point you in that direction. Uh, they tend to be expensive, but they're, they're high quality, um, you know, study materials they produce, as does uh, Lindsay Jones University. Um, most importantly, perhaps this should have been at the top of the list here is the National Board for Respiratory Care. Um, very rich in information in terms of reviewing the exam matrix for the ACCS and others. They also have sample questions. They have how to apply. Um, they also, something I use because when I took the ACCS exam, it was the first computerized exam that I take. I'm a little embarrassed to say that. But the nice thing with the MBRC is they have some sample templates uh, and, and screenshots that you can look at so that when you actually sit for the exam, you'll actually see kind of like the type of screen, where the buttons are, what you need to hit, how you can save a question and things along those lines. So don't overlook the obvious like I do sometimes and make sure that you go to the MBRC site as well. With that, you know, I want to wish you guys a whole heck of a lot of luck in studying for the, uh, for the ACCS exam. Um, you know, hopefully you got something out of this lecture and hopefully you come back to A&T lectures. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day.